Hi. The topic I'll be reviewing today is how DSP is killing analog in Certus. The agenda for today's talk is we'll start off with an introduction to Certus architectures. Then we'll move on to a comparison between traditional analog and more modern DSP-based approaches to Certus. I'll then do a deep dive on uh, two alternate approaches for linear equalization. One, using traditional analog approaches. The second, using DSP. The second deep dive topic will compare analog versus DSP-based approaches for timing recovery. And then we'll summarize all the key differences between analog and digital approaches. And I'll make my predictions for how both forms of architectures will be used moving forward on Certus designs. Here's a brief introduction myself. I'm currently the president and CEO of AlphaWave, a leader in DSP-based connectivity IPs. Prior to that, I've held positions as vice president of mixed signal IP at Intel Corporation. I've been a founder and president of V Semiconductor, a leader in 10 gig and 25 gig Certus IP. Prior to that, I was a executive and co-founder of Snowbush Microelectronics, a leader in early PCI Express, Gen 2, Gen 3, and 10 gig Certus IP. First, let's do a review of some Certus system basics. What a Certus does is it takes a parallel word of data, as you see here on the left, and it serializes it. Uh, so if you start off with eight parallel bits forming a byte of data, the Certus would serialize it by a factor of 8x and transmit that data eight times faster over a physical medium. Before sending the data through the channel and over the medium, uh, what the Certus will do is it will introduce some pre-distortion through transmit preemphasis. The pre-distortion tries to do a first order correction for any loss or attenuation the channel will introduce uh, over a broadband frequency. The output driver then drives the signal uh, onto the physical media. When the signal is received, uh, it is first detected through a receiving sense amplifier uh, the recovered signal is then equalized, and it can be equalized in either an analog or a digital form. Once that signal is equalized, it is sampled and then deserialized from a high-speed serial stream back to its parallel form. What you see here on the left hand slide is how interface speeds have scaled over the last 20 years. What has driven this frenetic increase in data rates is bandwidth requirements in our data centers. And as you can see, early in 2000, um, serial interfaces were introduced to the legacy parallel interfaces. Uh, and they started off around one gigabit with uh, early gigabit ethernet and early sonnet. Uh, charting the way for serial interfaces. Over time, more and more compute and connectivity were moved to serial interfaces to increase and scale bandwidths. Uh, SATA was an early storage standard that started at one and a half gig. PCI Express was introduced early in the 2000s as a compute interface. Uh, and 10 gigabit ethernet was the next generation of ethernet. Uh, which introduced four lanes of 3.125 gigabit per second data. Since then, uh, data rates have doubled every two to three years uh, to our current leading edge data rate of 112 gigabit per second serial interface used in Ethernet and PCI Express uh, currently at 32 gigabit per second NRZ standards. As data rates have scaled, so have the channel characteristics and the channel losses that these standards have uh, required services to be able to withstand. Uh, so at 
uh, two and a half and three and an eighth gigabit per second. Typical losses range anywhere from six and a half to 11 dB for NRZ standards. Uh, as NRZ standards scaled to six and a half and 10 gigabit per seconds, the losses increased to 24 up to 32 dB. Uh, the fastest uh, data rate used for NRZ is currently 32 gigabits per second. And for 25 gigabit Ethernet or 32 gigabit per second NRZ standards, services have to withstand up to 40 dB of uh, channel loss. Beyond that, uh, 56 gig PAM and 112 gigabit per second CERTUS data, uh, PAM4 was introduced as the signaling scheme. Uh, and even though the channel uh, requirements uh, reduced uh, with the introduction of PAM4 uh, because the symbol rate of PAM4 is half compared to NRZ. Certuses still had to withstand uh, approximately 40 dB of channel loss using PAM4. And that is the ceiling uh, uh, for Certus standards today in terms of upper ranges for uh, channel losses that Certuses need to withstand. As a reference, 40 dB channel loss is 100 times attenuation uh, of the signal at its Nyquist frequency. So if you transmit one volt of data, uh, a corresponding bit coming out uh, is only going to be 10 millivolts. So it's a significant amount of loss that Certus architectures need to compensate for. These days, CERTUS architectures have bifurcated to uh, PCI Express versus Ethernet CERTUSes. Uh, what we've done at AlphaWave is create a truly multi-standard CERTUS that can operate all the way down to 1 gigabit per second for legacy interfaces and all the way up to 100 gigabit per second PAM4 for leading edge Ethernet interfaces. Uh, and we can support everything in between. As you can see, on this slide, uh, whether it's PCI Express Gen 5, uh, 25 gig Ethernet, 56 gig uh, Ethernet, or 112 gigabit per second Ethernet. Now, let's move forward on to looking at architecture comparisons between traditional analog approaches versus more modern DSP based CERTUS architectures. Now let's compare an analog CERTUS architecture versus an ADC and DSP based architecture. You see in the analog architecture, all of the receive equalization, including the VGA, the CTLE, and the DFE, happens in the continuous time ahead of the slicing of the data. The CDR loop, uh, which includes the phase detector and the CDR, is also operating on continuous time data and driving the sampling point and the timing going into both the DFE and the slicer. Uh, analog architectures typically work well up to 36 dB NRZ and 30 to 32 dB PAM4 because all of the equalization and timing recovery is happening on continuous time data. Uh, the continuous time equalizer needs to be heavily calibrated in order to try to eliminate process temperature and voltage sensitivities. This makes analog architectures extremely sensitive to process and difficult to yield in high volume. Uh, the final drawback to analog architectures is timing of the DFE it is very difficult to scale to PAM4. Uh, look ahead uh, options result in uh, non-scalable approaches uh, in order to meet timing around the slicing and the DFE loop. Uh, so as data rates continue to scale faster, to fa faster and faster, this type of analog DFE based approach becomes extremely, extremely challenging. On the ADC side, uh, there is an AGC and a CTLE, albeit less continuous time equalization is needed. Then the signal is digitized using a time interleaved ADC. Afterwards, a digital FFE is employed, which is a digital form of a CTLE 
uh, a digital DFE is implemented that eliminates the high speed uh, timing critical loop around the sampling and a fully digital CDR loop is implemented. Uh, DSP based approaches typically can work up to 45 dB energy and without MLSE can work up to 36 to 40 dB PAM4 and with MLSE uh, can scale even higher to 45 plus dB. Since most of the equalization and timing is done in the digital world, it's quite insensitive to process. Uh, the drawback is clearly you need to have a high performance ADC and front end uh, and training all of this DSP is complicated. So uh, it certainly results in a more complicated uh, training requirement. Next, we're going to do a technical deep dive comparing linear equalization implemented in both a continuous time analog approach as well as a sampled time DSP based approach. What you see in this slide is a typical structure of both a boosting stage which is used in a CTLE as well as a VGA stage uh, which is typically part of an AGC or automatic gain control loop. By adjusting different parameters within the same stage, you can either boost high frequency Nyquist gain, or you can boost broadband overall DC and broadband gain. So by tuning the capacitance, which adjusts the zero in the transfer function of this stage, you can, by moving the zero to a lower frequency, by adding more and more cap in the source degeneration, effectively, uh, you can increase the Nyquist gain while not impacting lower frequency gain. Uh, otherwise, in a VGA stage, you can tune the load resistance or you can tune the source degeneration resistor or you can tune the tail current. And that results in both uh, changing the overall broadband gain as well as adjusting the 3 dB output uh, pole uh, of the single stage. So now in this example, we'll provide an overview of how analog linear equalizers work in both the frequency and time domain and outline some of the challenges they have with various channels. So the plot on the left shows a frequency response of a relatively smooth channel uh, over the bandwidth of interest. There's not many discontinuities uh, with an overall uh, insertion loss of about 25 dB, which means the uh, frequency loss at Nyquist relative to DC is 25 dB. With transmit preemphasis added in, the overall uh, loss from DC to Nyquist reduces to about 10 dB. And with an optimal CTLE uh, that is not perfectly matched to the channel, you end up with something that tries to flatten the channel response. But over the bandwidth of interest, there are there's parts of the spectrum where the signal is over-equalized as well as under-equalized. From a time domain pulse response perspective, the original signal in blue without any transmit or receive equalization is shown here. Uh, the vertical lines show the ideal sampling points of a receiver. And you can see with this 25 dB channel, there's clearly more than 20 taps of intersymbol interference uh, that would cause complete eye closure on the signal. With transmit preemphasis, the amount of ISI from the ideal sampling point is reduced to maybe 20 taps of intersymbol interference. Uh, and with the received CTLE, you see the overall pulse response is now much tighter with less intersymbol interference further out, but it does result in over-equalization in nearby pre and post cursor taps. Uh, which a DFE on the receiver can aid on the post cursor taps without any means of being able to deal with the residue precursor taps. So this is typically one weakness in analog approaches, which is you need many DFE taps to deal with residual ISI. And typically there's not, not much you can do 
on the residual precursor ISI after you apply transmit preemphasis. There's a second type of channel which has uh, more reflections and or discontinuities. And so the blue, once again, shows the raw channel. The uh, green shows with transmit preemphasis how the overall channel flatness is improved over the bandwidth of interest. And ultimately, the red curve shows with received CTLE. From a pulse response perspective, the blue uh, demonstrates the original response. You see there's significant reflections ranging from 10 to 20 UI. The green shows with transmit preemphasis how some of the nearby post cursor and precursor ISI are mitigated. And then the red shows the advantage of CTLE. However, CTLE has no means of compensating and many times amplifies these trailing uh, intersymbol interference. And as a result, only a DFE can come in in an analog architecture to deal with these reflections. So at the end of the day, all analog CTLEs require many, many tabs of DFE to deal with the inevitable uh, discontinuities that come in from modern, uh, modern servers, modern backplanes, modern cables. Now let's look at a DSP-based implementation of a linear equalizer. So an FFE, as implemented in the DSP world, is just a uh, finite impulse response filter where various samples are added together. Uh, each term has its own independent gain coefficient associated with it. This uh, this can generate a frequency response and by changing the gain coefficients and expanding the number of samples summed together uh, allows us to create uh, a quite arbitrary and quite uh, complex filter that can equalize out a broad range of channels. Now at 100 gigabit per second uh, it is very difficult to implement a multiplier and an adder that can run at 56 gigasamples per second for PAM4 data. So a parallel implementation is needed. And what that means is for every single clock cycle, multiple FIR filters are implemented at the same time. And so that leads to a type of DSP called block DSP, where on a single clock edge, you don't operate on a single byte of data, but rather a block, where a block consists of multiple symbols of data. So what we show in this implementation is a four by four uh, block FIR filter. And so it's a four tap FFE operating uh, and generating four outputs on a single clock cycle. And so what you see here is how the same data is reused for all four output FFEs at the same time. Each FFE has its own set of gain coefficients, as you see here. So each branch of FFE can have a slightly different frequency response than other branches. And so block DSP is critical for keeping DSP clock rates at manageable rates. And uh, coefficients can be tapered so that if the coefficient range of A3 is only half that of A1 uh, and A2 only needs to be three quarter of A1, uh, these co the number of bits allocated to each coefficient can also be tapered. One of the advantages of this approach is that by analyzing the coefficients that LMS training converges to also allows us to extract very, very useful information in regards to the channel. By analyzing the coefficients, we can calculate the DC gain of the channel. We can calculate the Nyquist gain of the channel. We can calculate the gain at half the Nyquist frequency and any other arbitrary frequency that we desire. 
uh, by analyzing the gain coefficients. This capability allows us to not only equalize the signal, but also extract critical information as to the properties of the channels that we're equalizing. Now, let's look how a linear equalizer is implemented in the digital world and reevaluate the strengths and weaknesses of implementing the same functionality as the analog equalizer, but on a sampled system using DSP techniques. So the way a, a digital equalizer is implemented is through an RX FIR, finite impulse response filter. Uh, typically these filters involve five to 25 taps of uh, samples. Some of the samples are sampled ahead of the main pulse response. Some of these samples are sampled after the main pulse response. And five to 25 of these taps are combined and formed with different gain coefficients to create a channel response. So going back to our original channel where we had relatively linear loss uh, with transmit equalizer, you see that loss is somewhat stabilized. And with the RX FIR as a linear equalizer, you see that we're able to quite effectively flatten that channel. From an overall pulse response, you see the original blue curve with intersymbol interference trailing over 20 UI. Uh, is tightened up with the RX FIR so effectively there is zero residual ISI at the sample points uh, resulting in a pristine equalization at the receiver. On a more reflective channel as you see here a RX FIR is able especially with over 20 taps is able to quite effectively flatten out the residual response. And what you see in the original channel with the blue, with a significant amount of ISI beyond 20 taps, uh, results in the green curve, where at these dots that you see, which is where the ADC samples, all of the residual ISI is effectively equalized out. So there clearly is a significant advantage using RXFIRs, such that much more complex filter shapes can be implemented to try to optimally equalize out channels, including discontinuities. Furthermore, since that filter is implemented digitally, so long as the signal coming out of the ADC is stabilized over temperature process and voltage, the filter response is invariant to any of these environmental factors. This makes DSP-based designs potentially more resilient to process voltage and temperature variations uh, when implementing linear equalization compared to analog approaches. Next, let's compare how timing recovery is done in both analog approaches as well as using DSP approaches. Analog timing recovery for baud rate systems typically use one of two different approaches for extracting sampling error. The first approach uses a, a timing error detector called a Mueller-Mueller error detector. The second approach uses a minimal mean squared error detector. The way a Mueller-Mueller timing error detector works is the signal is sampled at the baud rate or at the symbol rate. And the correlation between the current sample versus the precursor sample is compared to the correlation of the current sample to the postcursor sample. And the timing is stabilized when there's an equal correlation from the main sample to both the precursor as well as the post cursor sample. So in this example, for a pulse response, the locking point is when the sample voltage on the precursor is equivalent to the sample voltage on the precursor. So for a pulse response, this defines equilibrium. For PRBS data, it's when the correlation between post and pre are equal. 
This is a typical class A Mueller Mueller. A class B Mueller Mueller is a slight alternative to this, where rather than comparing uh, precursor ISI correlation to postcursor ISI, uh, the approach is to try to zero out the precursor ISI. And so the ideal sampling point is when there is no, zero, no precursor ISI in the signal. Typically, that may not result in a sample point in the center of the eye, since its objective is to zero out the precursor while doing nothing with the postcursor. Another drawback is once you get to PAM4 receivers, uh, you need a significant number of comparators to determine where the slicing voltage is and where the target voltages are. So typically for PAM4 analog receivers, more than 20 comparators are needed. Uh, a 20 comparator design uh, starts to look like a four to five bit ADC. So power starts to increase on analog approaches. Uh, when you get to a PAM4 receiver. Uh, a second timing approach uh, that tries to better center the sampling point at the optimal point uses a, a minimal mean squared error timing error detector. And the concept of a MMSC detector is that it tries to find the sampling point in the signal where the target voltage that is set, any error to that target voltage relative to sampling error is eliminated. So if the ideal sampling point of a signal is plus minus one, it will adjust the phase of the samples until uh, the residual error, as you see here, is minimized. Now, one of the drawbacks of using an MMSE is that in order to minimize that error, you not only need to sample whether the signal is above or below the target value, but you also need to know what is the gradient of the signal at the point of the sample. So you need information on the slope of the signal where you've sampled it. So typical implementations uh, require an analog slope detector in addition to, to an air comparator that determines whether you're above and or below the threshold. So the, the typical challenge with analog MMSC receivers is in implementing this analog slope detector and then multiplying that signal or XORing that signal using a bang bang approach to generate an overall early late signal to drive the CDR loop. Now let's look at a DSP-based implementation of an equivalent Mueller-Mueller Class A, Class B timing error detector. Uh, what you see here is a block DSP-based approach where for a 4x4 block DSP, as we, as we examined with the linear equalizer, uh, on a single clock edge, we're able to implement and extract the correlation of a single sample to its pre and post cursor sample to generate a timing error detector output. And what you see in this example is that uh, our digital slicers slice both the data as well as generate the CDR timing loop error detector on the same clock edge. So for every clock that happens, we get four bits of data to drive our CDR loops. I show an example here on the right, which shows the timing error detector phase transfer curve, which for PAM4 data uh, is an extremely linear error curve, uh, which allows us to not only phase lock the signal, but even frequency lock the signal. Now we move on to a DSP-based implementation for a minimal mean squared error timing error detector. Uh, if you recall, in an analog approach, you need two pieces of information for an MMSE detector. Uh, what's the error of the sample 
relative to the ideal target and what's the slope of the sample at the point of sampling. Uh, what we're able to do in a DSP-based world is rather than have a digital derivative detector, which will be very costly from an implementation perspective, is we can digitally estimate the slope of the signal uh, based on creating a interpolation filter. So in the digital world, we can interpolate the signal for small timing offsets using a FIR filter. And so by sampling the signal and passing it through an FIR filter, we can approximate the slope of the signal, uh, especially if we know that the signal is band limited such that the frequency at Nyquist uh, is at least 3 dB lower than lower frequencies. Given that, uh, we can leverage uh, a type of FIR filter known as fractional delay filters or polyphase filters to interpolate the slope. Given that interpolation, uh, we can sample the signal once per bit baud or once per symbol and we can use FIR filters to approximate the slope. Uh, we also know what the error are and thus have all the information for implementing an MMSE timing error detector uh, while only sampling the signal uh, once per baud. What you see here on the right is an example of how effective a fractional delay filter is when estimating uh, and recreating a continuous time signal. So the blue is a original signal and the red is a uh, recreated signal from a baud rate sample using a fractional delay filter. And this shows how well the two align and match and thus how reliable a uh, slope detector or derivative filter is uh, when operating on baud rate sampling. So time to wrap things up. Here at AlphaWave, we're the world leader on delivering DSP-based service architecture to drive next generation of interfaces, whether it's in the data center, whether it's for AI capabilities, whether it's for the next generation 5G base station connecting all of us over our mobile devices, or whether it's to drive next generation optics within data centers, across buildings, or across oceans. And finally, DSP-based architectures are also making their way into computing ICs, whether it's to drive the next generation of PCI Express from the CPU to the SSD, or whether it's to drive the next generation CXL from machine learning accelerators. Our 1 to 112 gig Alpha Core and Zeus Core IPs are the world leader in delivering optimal long reach performance at the world's best power and area metrics. So let's get to the key question from today's talk. Is the analog certus dying? Uh, I don't believe so. Uh, people have forecasted the death of analog uh, for many, many decades, and analog is still here. It's a critical part of all of our interface IPs. However, I think the use of analog certus is transitioning uh, to how it's used in RF, cable modem, and DSL. And what that means is analog is used to interface to the outside world. Uh, you always need to match impedances there always needs to be some sort of continuous time filter in front of an ADC or a DDA. However, analog is not used to process or condition signals. Uh, and so I think what's happened in the CERTUS world, whether you're driving optics or whether you're driving 
uh, electrical channels is that the losses and the dispersion are at a point where we need to use DSP based approaches to process and condition the signals but analog will inevitably be needed on the line drivers and on the analog front ends to prepare the signals for DSP processing. So if you're an analog designer or thinking of it being an analog designer uh, don't be afraid there will always be a need uh, it will forever be considered a, uh, a black art to most in the industry I hope this talk helped to dispel some of that black magic that people assume analog designers are able to sprinkle into their circuits uh, and as I look forward as to what's next for Certus, uh, especially with an eye on the next generation interface being 224 gigabit per second. Uh, now that we've introduced ADC and DSP into Certus, where do we go from there? Uh, could it be the modem? Could it be that we introduce more significant modulation schemes uh, to help enable a doubling of the data rate without needing a doubling of our channel bandwidths and we have a talk posted on our web website uh, already that is specifically on this so be sure to check it out thank you have a great day